It's uh, really a pleasure to be one of the speakers of this environmental engagement. And I would uh, like to talk over the next uh, 45 minutes or maybe a bit longer on uh, the role of the ocean. And uh, I mean, as you all know, I mean, we human, humans are changing uh, Earth in general quite a bit, as uh, this cartoon shows. I mean, we are uh, harvesting oil from uh, the geosphere, um, refining it. Uh, we are quite engaged in deforestation, in agriculture, um, and and this will be the topic uh, of uh, today. Uh, we are also changing uh, marine systems in uh, many ways, and this will be the topic of um, this lecture in general. But before I go into the ocean, I would like to uh, highlight the distribution of the biomass mass on Earth. And as you can see, I mean, all these kingdoms of life, the plants are making up the largest fraction of uh, the biomass, of the living biomass on Earth, of course, with 450 gigatons. Gigatons is uh, like uh, one essentially with nine zeros on it in terms of tons. And uh, so the plants are making up the largest fraction. Then comes uh, the bacteria, the fungi, then uh, the protists like the flagella and only a small portion uh, here, for example, uh, the animals uh, with around two gigatons of carbon. And if we zoom into the animals, then we have uh, here about from these two gigatons of animals, we have about one gigaton carbon in terms of this all expressed in terms of uh, organic carbon. Uh, here for the arthropods, and these are basically like crabs or insects, uh, for example. Um, then the next uh, category is the fish with 0.7, so there's quite a lot of fish around. And then uh, here the annelids, uh, like the earthworm, for example, mollusks, uh, for example, the snails. Here, then cnidarians, the most famous uh, cnidarians are jellyfish, for example, or corals. And then here are the humans with 0.06 gigatons of uh, carbon. And, so, and then uh, here you have the wild mammals with 0.007, so a larger, uh, uh, quite a small fraction. And then the wild birds with 002 gigatons of carbon. And compared to humans, wild animals, and wild birds, look at this, the livestock is 0.1. And livestock means this is cattle, this is sheep, this is everything what we, basically this chicken, all this, what we use essentially for our consumption. If we eat meat, we eat livestock. And this livestock is 10 times larger essentially as our biomass and the biomass of the wild mammals and the wild birds. So this is a substantial fraction. This also tells you how much we already influence Earth and the biomass of the Earth. I mean, we have 10 times more biomass for livestock to feed us than we have uh, wild mammals and wild birds on Earth. And now we go to the ocean. The ocean is essentially covering most of uh, the Earth's surface. This is probably all uh, known to you. Uh, the mean depth is uh, 3.8 kilometers. And when we, for example, put uh, mm -hmm. like scale it down, the size of the ocean to an A4 page, which is all familiar to you, then the, surface, then the surface of the ocean would be the surface of one A4, and the mean depth of 3.8 kilometers of the ocean would be the thickness of an A4. And this tells you that despite the fact that there is, a, this is quite a deep water, actually in terms of the surface of the ocean, it is essentially a thin layer uh, of uh, of ocean and therefore 
like lateral transport, water masses uh, ste have to steer the, the ocean in order to make exchange of uh, nutrients, exchange of uh, biomass. So when we think of uh, about the ocean, uh, we as uh, coming from a landlocked country, we have a sort of a very specific picture on the sea. I mean, we go typically on vacation to the sea, and this is what we're doing during the summer to warm regions. And therefore, we think of the ocean more like as a recreational site. We are thinking of uh, beautiful beaches, of coral reefs, maybe, and so on. But um, this is only one uh, side of the coin. Uh, we don't really know much of uh, the animals, what kind of animals are living in the ocean. And for this, there has been the census of marine life created, which was a huge international effort to describe all the species there are in um, the ocean, uh, focusing particularly on the, the deep sea, because the deep sea is largely unknown uh, to us. And this uh, program, there were 80 nations involved in this program. And um, there, it ran from uh, 2000 to 2010, so for 10 years. And there have been 122,000 uh, new species uh, described, which were not known before. And here are some examples from the deep sea of uh, species which have not been uh, described before. And I had the privilege to uh, lead um, this census of marine microbes, so basically barcoding the microbial uh, life uh, in the ocean. And I mean, this 122,000 species, this is excluding the microbes. So there was a, this was a tremendous uh, success in uh, investigating and uh, discovering uh, new species. So when we think of the ocean, what does the ocean do to us humans? Uh, we coined this ecosystem service, which is sort of an anthropocentric view of the ocean, to think of a service to humans. So the ocean is delivering quite some services. Uh, one type of service, of ecosystem service, uh, is that it influences our climate. It also serves as a um, source where we receive our nutrition from, for example, the fisheries. Uh, it's also a site uh, where we, which offers uh, energy resources and other essential uh, resources to us. And then of course, it uh, uh, also serves as a recreational site as I indicated before, which is particularly relevant for uh, people from uh, landlocked uh, countries, because this is what uh, where most of the people experience the ocean as a source of recreation. And all our activities, which was uh, shown in the cartoon before, uh, leads to quite some problems, which I will address uh, in the coming uh, half an hour or so. I mean, it leads, or the human activities leads to a warming of the ocean, uh, global warming also affects, of course, the ocean. I will show you to what extent. Uh, it leads to an acidification of the ocean, which means the ocean is getting more acidic. Uh, this warming, the global warming, leads also to sea level rise. Uh, human activities also lead to uh, eutrophication, so nutrient input into coastal seas. Uh, now in the news is the Marmara Sea, uh, between the Black Sea, this uh, regional sea between the Black Sea and the Aegean Sea, where there is a massive uh, algal bloom forming um, some mucilage floating, basically a slimy layer floating on top of uh, this Marmara Sea. Uh, human activities also lead, of course, to overfishing. It is also used as a dumping site. And um, this warming of the ocean also leads to a deoxygenation. So the ocean is losing oxygen. And oxygen is, of course, uh, required for uh, most of the life we have uh, in the ocean. They need oxygen for respiration. Uh, 
And then there are some more sporadic, uh, sporadic disturbances, what we typically call disasters, like, for example, oil slicks and oil spill. Um, so the ocean is uh, essentially relevant for our climate. And this uh, figure uh, is uh, actually showing that it shows essentially, these are satellite images, a composite essentially, showing essentially with the different colors, the temperature of uh, the ocean. So near the tropics, you have warmer temperature, close to 30 degrees centigrade. And what I would particularly point out here, and I hope you see the cursor here, um, the Gulf Stream, for example. In the Gulf of Mexico, there is warm water coming out, then meandering across the Atlantic, releasing heat to the atmosphere, so it's heating the atmosphere. And then eventually here in the north, between Greenland, Iceland, and the Norwegian Sea, the Gulf Stream, which is a very salty water, is uh, getting colder, and cold water is getting heavier. And then basically it sinks uh, into the deeper ocean and drives essentially what's called the thermohaline uh, circulation. I will come to that. So you will see that, I mean, there is heat transport from the tropics uh, into the northern and the southern uh, hemisphere with these ocean uh, currents. And uh, this is uh, shown here how this uh, works. So here is the Gulf Stream coming out uh, of the Gulf of Mexico flowing towards the north. And here in uh, this region between Greenland, Iceland, and the Norwegian Sea, also called the Chin Sea, uh, there you have deep water formation. These are the darker arrows here. Uh, these are deep waters. And here these are the light or the white uh, arrows. This is surface uh, water. So you have a complex circulation pattern in the ocean, which is, is essential to regulate our climate. So the Gulf Stream as a surface water is descending into the deeper layers of uh, the ocean here and is essentially driving and becoming the north, so-called North Atlantic deep water. And the North Atlantic deep water is, dry, is the driving force essentially of the so-called thermohaline circulation pattern. And the term thermohaline tells it already. This is all this whole water mass transport is regulated by temperature changes and salinity changes. So when the water is getting more saline, it is heavier and sinks to the bottom. So this shows here, you here, this is the, the North Atlantic deep water. Then you have here again, uh, deep water formation around Antarctica. Wherever you have cold regions, you have deep water formation where temperate, where the sea is losing heat to the atmosphere, then the uh, water is uh, increasing in its uh, specific density, sinking to the bottom. And this thermohaline circulation pattern really connects all the, all the three basins, the big basins, the Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, and the Pacific in terms of uh, 1,000 to 1,500 uh, years. So this is a major driving force of uh, our climate. And uh, talking about uh, global uh, climate uh, and uh, global warming, as you can see here, from uh, 1971 onwards uh, to 2010, this figure shows you the energy which has been in terms of uh, zeta joules which means 10 to the 21 joules which be, it means 21 zeros behind this one joule and what uh, you see clearly here is that the upper ocean took most of um, the energy most of the heat is taken up by the upper ocean even the deep ocean is taking up heat uh, only like by 0.1 degrees centigrade, the deep ocean is warming, but it is a large, extremely large volume. So it is also a substantial fraction is taken up by the deep uh, ocean and only a small fraction is taking up uh, land and the atmosphere, for example. 
So the ocean is the main storage of uh, heat on, uh, on Earth. And as a consequence of this, of course, the ocean is uh, warming. And uh, I mean, this shows you in, uh, the situation in the atmosphere. Um, the CO2 increase in the atmosphere from the South Pole uh, to here, the red station is station Mauna Loa on Big Island of Hawaii. And you see the seasonal dynamics, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere in terms of CO2 in the atmosphere. This is the record here on the right hand side of the Mauna Loa. You see the zigzag, which means um, these are the seasonal changes. In winter, you have higher CO2 concentrations because there is less uh, solar radiation, so there is less uptake by plants of uh, CO2. And uh, so what you see is here at all these uh, different stations, uh, there is more and more measuring stations of atmospheric CO2. You see these large fluctuations in the Northern Hemisphere, seasonal fluctuations uh, of CO2 in the Northern Hemisphere, because here we have also a larger land biomass. So most of our land biomass on the globe is in the Northern Hemisphere. Therefore, we have much larger seasonal fluctuations in the Northern Hemisphere than in the South, where it's a more steady increase over time. And uh, now we have essentially uh, like uh, we reached 420 ppm of uh, CO2 concentration uh, now. And uh, so this is uh, stopping then somewhere uh, soon here. And then you will see on the right hand side, uh, this is the Mauna Loa panel. And then of course you, recon you can reconstruct uh, the climate uh, or the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. Uh, till uh, 1958. It was uh, Roger Rivell who coined the term uh, global warming in 1956. So it's uh, like 65 years ago. Uh, Roger Rivell, an atmospheric chemist uh, working at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, he was the first one uh, really coining the term global uh, warming because of the increase in CO2. And uh, of course, you can reconstruct the CO2 concentrations uh, in the atmosphere based on uh, ice cores, like the Vostok ice core in Antarctica, which is a thick layer of ice. So you can uh, drill, you can uh, drill holes in it, and then you can the air bubbles and trap. You can measure the carbon dioxide concentrations, and what you see is that uh, the uh, CO2 concentration on Earth was essentially uh, varying between the Ice Age and uh, interglacial periods uh, over from 158 ppm to 258, 300 ppm roughly, but uh, never to that extent where we are now. Okay, so this is the increase in uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. But uh, this is only 50% of uh, what we release in the atmosphere really uh, stays in the atmosphere. There is also quite some uptake by the land biomass, uh, particularly the northern hemisphere forests are taking up as, uh, like uh, one quarter and another quarter is taking up by the ocean. And uh, so what does this do? This uh, uptake of CO2 in the ocean, where, does, where is it? And this is uh, shown here roughly. You have here, like in the center here, this is Antarctica. You have here the Atlantic Ocean, uh, here the Pacific Ocean, and here the Indian Ocean, the three major basins, uh, oceanic basins. And what you see here in color code is the CO2, which is derived from fossil fuel burning. So you can easily determine the contribution and the concentration of uh, so-called anthropogenic carbon dioxide. So this is the carbon dioxide produced and generated by fossil fuel burning. And uh, what you can see is um, that this is pretty much linked to the currents. The currents are here shown with these arrows. So you have here basically the Gulf Stream 
bringing water to the Greenland, Iceland, Norwegian Sea, then uh, the Gulf Stream, basically the specific density is uh, high. So it uh, descends to the bottom and becomes then the North Atlantic deep water indicated here with this NADW and brings and transports essentially waters uh, towards uh, Antarctica. And as you can see here, I mean, we have here an invasion of anthropogenic CO2 down to 2,500 meters, actually at down to 30 degrees north, which is essentially the latitude of the Canary Islands. So even at the Canary Islands in uh, 1,500, 1,800 meters, we can detect anthropogenic carbon dioxide already. And this waters are flowing essentially slowly to the uh, south. So we will have uh, basically over the next 100 years anthropogenic carbon dioxide till the equator. Uh, here in the Pacific, we only have uh, the anthropogenic carbon dioxide in the top uh, 500 meters roughly so there is of course an exchange between the atmosphere and the surface ocean so the mixed layer contains anthropogenic carbon dioxide same with the indian ocean uh, the reason why there is no um, uh, anthropogenic carbon dioxide in the deep waters of the indian ocean or the pacific is uh, because we don't have deep water formation in the Indian Ocean and also not in the uh, Pacific. We have deep water formation only in the Atlantic. In the Pacific, we would we have deep water formation in, Anta in the Arctic, of course, but then we have the Aleutian Island Arch connecting essentially Siberia with Alaska, and these heavy waters cannot flow over it. So therefore, we don't have deep water formation in the Pacific. So. So the surface waters are enriched in anthropogenic uh, CO2. When you integrate this, uh, as indicated here, when you integrate this from the surface to the bottom, uh, then you see that it's essentially the Atlantic, the North Atlantic, where you have the highest uh, level of anthropogenic carbon dioxide. And of course, around the Southern Ocean, around Antarctica, you also have high uh, concentrations because here we also have deep water formation. So wherever we have deep water formation, we have anthropogenic carbon dioxide distributed to great uh, uh, depth. While in the Pacific here, we don't see that because as I mentioned, we have here the Aleutian Arch, which does not allow the deep water is entering um, the uh, Pacific. Okay. So what does it do, this anthropogenic CO2 in the ocean? This is again uh, the curve which you have already seen, the zigzag curve from uh, Mauna Loa. Here, the, this is Big Island, and this is the station Mauna Loa where uh, the CO2 measurements are done continuously since uh, 1958. And, uh, uh, here is Station Aloha, a station which is also serviced regularly. Uh, and these are, these are the concentrations in green of uh, the CO2 in the ocean and at this station in the surface waters. And you can see there is uh, quite some variation in it. Uh, this is because of phytoplankton blooms, sporadic phytoplankton blooms. Whenever you have a phytoplankton bloom, you will have a decrease in CO2 in the surface ocean. When there is respiration dominating, you have, of course, a higher CO2 concentration. But overall, when you do the trend line here, this runs pretty parallel. So over the years, as the CO2 in the atmosphere is increasing, so is the concentration of CO2 in the ocean increasing. And at the same time, this increasing CO2 in the ocean leads to a decrease in the pH of um, the seawater. Typically, the sea has a pH of eight, so it's an alkaline environment. And this uh, decreases with the increasing CO2 concentration the ocean is getting more acidic and uh, this means that it approaches uh, pH of 7, which would be neutral, 
and it, uh, there are predictions and forecasts that uh, till 2100 we will have a more acidic ocean with the pH concentrations of seven and below seven. And this acid, uh, ocean acidification, as it's called, this has consequences because uh, there are quite a number of uh, marine organisms which build up a um, calcareous skeleton. So the, for like, um, here are some examples uh, like uh, algae uh, have, of course, some of them have a calcareous skeleton outside of the cell wall. Uh, snails, for example, or sea urchins, they have a calcareous skeleton or mussels, for example, and scallops, they have uh, calcareous uh, skeletons. So this ocean acidification leads to a reduced calcification rate. And this is, of course, also affecting coral reefs. I mean, these are the most spectacular systems uh, where, you have, um, where you have a calcareous skeleton. These reefs are built basically uh, from uh, these corals. They build up massive uh, skeletons, massive uh, calcareous uh, reefs. And this ocean acidification, if this goes on, is definitely leading to reduced growth and production and probably also a lifetime of uh, organisms and eventually also to uh, changing composition of uh, species. And here are some examples of experiments which show the effect of uh, declining pH. So these are, this is a species, Emiliana Huxley of uh, calcareous algae uh, with uh, the so-called coccolids uh, made out of um, calcium carbonate and uh, they are growing under normal pH here different species and here under acidic pH and what you see is you have a deformation of these calcareous uh, skeletons but also muscles for example like here these uh, black muscles mytilusidulis um, will uh, be impacted because they also have this calcareous uh, skeleton. So um, the ocean is very different from uh, the terrestrial system. When we think of the base of uh, the food web, the base of the food web on land, uh, multicellular organisms are uh, is grassland, the trees, bushes, and so on, and they are fairly slow growing as compared to the single cell uh, phytoplankton, to this uh, single cell algae. Um, so when we take, for example, all the plant biomass on Earth, we have 99% of all the plant biomass is in the terrestrial environment. Only 1% is uh, really in the ocean. And this 1% of plant biomass which we have in the ocean contributes 50% of the total plant biomass production on Earth. So this 1% contributes the same uh, biomass production as the 99% of the terrestrial plant biomass. So why is that? And this is because this uh, marine algae the primary, these are the main, main primary producers, they are heavily grazed. So they are highly active, but they are heavily grazed. They are grazed by uh, so-called zooplankton, by small animals. And this plant biomass is highly active. If they would not be grazing, they would double the biomass every other day, roughly. So this tells you of how active they are. I mean, they're as compared to the terrestrial uh, environment. In the terrestrial environment, the trees and the bushes, they are basically not really very efficiently grazed in contrast to the marine environment. And this uh, shows you roughly a very simplified view on the marine food web with this uh, algae of different size and these uh, different algae are grazed by different size categories uh, here of uh, animals and uh, up to the, to the fish here. And the microbes, they utilize dissolved organic material, which is released by the phytoplankton and bringing back, basically converting dissolved organic material 
into particulate organic material like uh, bacterial biomass, which can then be also grazed by uh, higher trophic levels. And here are some examples of algae, here are dinoflagellates. Here, this is again the Coccolit, uh, Coccolita Emilia Huxley. And this is some, um, these are some zooplankton, some animals grazing on this algae quite intensively and <coughs> keeping it uh, low. This is a, a krill, uh, one of the main uh, grazing components of the Southern Ocean, which can get become also quite, quite large. So basically what we have shown you is uh, depicted here again. Uh, the ocean is of course in gas exchange with the atmosphere. And uh, it's shown here, I mean, there is sunlight uh, uh, used as for the algae. And if algae are growing uh, quite intensively, they draw down carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into the ocean. They generate biomass. This biomass is heavily grazed uh, upon by the animals, by the small animals, by the so-called zooplankton, and then eventually they end up in fish. So this happens in the surface waters, in the sunlit surface waters. So there is a rapid exchange of carbon dioxide between the atmosphere and the ocean, and it's back released. And only about 10 to 30% of what is fixed by this phytoplankton in terms of carbon dioxide uh, converted to organic carbon, to biomass, is exported into the deeper layers of the ocean below 150 meter depth. Only 10 to 30% of, of this organic material is really leaving the euphotic layer, entering the ocean, and there in the, the deep sea, all the deep sea animals are really depending on this organic material flux into the ocean where it is slowly remineralized. And this is called the so-called biological carbon pump. Uh, so the ocean is not always in complete equilibrium between the uptake of CO2 and the release of CO2, very productive waters like the North Atlantic takes up more carbon dioxide than it releases, while the subtropical and tropical oceans are releasing more CO2 than they are taking up. So there is more so-called remineralization. There is more organic matter remineralized in the subtropical, tropical regions than produced because this is the export from the north uh from the northern latitudes to the south so there is an export of organic uh, material while in the uh, northern regions um, at around 50 degrees 60 degrees uh, north around iceland for example there is more carbon dioxide taking up from uh, the atmosphere than uh, uh, released so these are net, so-called net heterotrophic systems okay so what does the warming do now for coral uh, reefs, for example? Uh, this is shown here uh, with pictures from the um, Great Barrier Reef. Uh, here in A, panel A, this is an aerial view from a um, plane. And you see this, uh, this is corals and the white spots here, these are calcareous skeletons. These are naked skeletons. There are no corals anymore. Uh, and this is because of the so-called marine heat waves. We are not only having now uh, heat waves on land, but we also talk about marine heat waves in uh, the ocean. And this, is, uh, this happened in 2016, 2017, and 18 quite uh, intensively in the coral reefs. I mean, corals, do like uh, warm waters, but if it's getting a, if the water temperature is getting above 28, 29 degrees centigrade, then they are getting really stressed and then they die off. And this is uh, shown here in B, where you have basically a naked uh, calcareous uh, skeleton. There is no life anymore, and there can no, there can be no growth anymore of uh, the coral uh, polyps. So this will slowly dissolve in um, the seawater. So this uh, warming aspects 
of the surface ocean causes uh, pretty much stress to the coral reefs and coral reefs in general are growing quite slowly and need some uh, nutrient poor waters and so they are not only affected by warming but also by eutrophication uh, particularly in southeast asia and this leads to the fact that only about one third of all the coral reefs on a global scale can be called intact um, particularly in this in the pacific um, there are some, quite some intact coral reefs, but um, the majority of uh, these coastal coral reefs are in Southeast Asia, but also now in Australia are uh, in, in danger. Another aspect which received uh, considerable attention over the last uh, years is uh, the production or the, the plastic issue in uh, in the ocean, I mean, the annual plastic production increased tremendously from the 1950s. So 60 years ago, there was hardly any plastic production. And um, this uh, increase is essentially exponentially the global um, annual plastic production uh, is indicated here. And uh, from this plastic uh, production, a lot is entering uh, the sea via rivers because of uh, mismanaged plastic waste. About 8 million tons of uh, plastic are entering the ocean every year. And the, there is, of course, this causes pictures like that, like the beach at uh, Safaga in the Red Sea, where you see there is a, a lot of uh, plastic bottles and so on uh, washed ashore. Uh, daily for the marine environment, I mean, the fishing nets, for example, which are also made out of plastic, uh, where uh, like here the turtles can get entangled. Uh, so this uh, represents a major threat, but this is visible to us. But there is also a lot of uh, microplastics uh, in the ocean, which is a bit harder to quantify how much this is. But uh, microplastics is essentially in all the cosmetics and shampoos which we are using or in toothpastes, uh, for example. Uh, so there is a lot of microplastics uh, in um, uh, which we are producing, which are also released into our wastewater system systems and which are essentially ending up uh, in the ocean as indicated here. Um, uh, as indicated, like from 2001 to 2019, basically the plastic production more, more than doubled. Um, this uh, gives you an idea on the magnitude uh, we are facing. And what is shown here is essentially the accumulation of uh, plastic material according to the size. So these are small uh, fractions in the upper left pan panel from 0.33 millimeter to one millimeter particles. Uh, and then here the larger uh, size fraction here. Uh, and then the bigger fractions are less abundant, of course. So the smaller the particles, the more abundant uh, they are. And they accumulate particularly in this uh, gyre system in the Pacific, but also in the Atlantic uh, gyre system. These are, uh, clockwise uh, circulation patterns here, where the water masses is flowing in this direction, clockwise, uh, where essentially plastic uh, becomes uh, entrapped. And uh, there is also, there are cleanup initiatives, uh, like from Boyan Slat, the ocean cleanup, where uh, they are putting like floats out into the Pacific uh, gyre, the so-called Great Garbage uh, Patch in the ocean, which is a 400 meter long tube essentially uh, directed against the current where essentially the, the idea is that in this uh, current pattern, uh, the plastic will passively accumulate here. And uh, after several tries, trials now, I mean, this 
is successfully re pretty much uh, recovering large plastic, but only large plastic, which is uh, floating at the surface. But there are also tests now, and this is a much more efficient way uh, where with sort of catamarans, where in the middle between the two hulls, there is like an um, assembly line where plastic material is put, is put out and, and taken out of rivers. Like in Southeast Asia, for example, there are rivers transporting a lot of this plastic into the ocean. And this is now also by this uh, initiative um, there are these catamarans installed in a number of rivers where the plastic is, uh, is removed. And the idea would be, I mean, this is what uh, Boyan Slat um, claims that he would remove 50% of the floating plastic out of the Pacific within the next five years. So we will see how this works uh, out. Another a uh, problem there is, is uh, the fisheries. Uh, I mean, uh, we are harvesting uh, fish from the ocean and actually um, food from the sea is not really that important for us. 98% uh, of all our food stuff, what we eat, comes from agriculture on a global scale. I mean, there are some regional differences, of course, uh, like Jap Japanese, it, they eat a bit more seafood than, um, than this figure shows. But on the global average, it's uh, like 98% of all our food stuff comes from agriculture, only 2% from the ocean. And so how come that uh, we have these fish stocks in the North Atlantic or in the Mediterranean so depleted uh, already? And there is another problem, of course, uh, with agriculture. I mean, what we harvest from agriculture, this is pretty much on its limit. And with a rising population and by the um, year 2050, we should uh, be at a reach around uh, 10 billion people on earth. So the question is, how do we really uh, feed the people? And uh, so it is quite uh, illustrative to compare what we are doing uh, on land in, in agriculture versus in fisheries. And what we do in uh, agriculture on land is essentially here eating, we are harvesting corn, we are uh, eating um, uh, vegetables, rice. Uh, so basically this is the base of the food web. And if we eat meat, we eat essentially like sheep or cattle. So these are plants, these are herbivores, they are eating plants. So this is what we are, what we are harvesting in the terrestrial environment here. And I've shown you at the beginning, I mean, that we have a quite a large, 10 times more uh, livestock uh, than uh, a human population uh, or than uh, uh, wild animals. So, but this is where we are, we are pretty much in the agriculture in the terrestrial environment in the base of the food web. In contrast, in the marine environment, we are harvesting predatory fish. We are harvesting the top uh, trophic levels. And the further up we come to in this uh, food web, the less biomass we have available. So we are what we are doing in uh, the marine fisheries. We are basically fishing down the food web. So we are we are harvesting the tuna, which is a big uh, predatory fish. There is not really so much biomass available, uh, and then we are harvesting salmon, um, sea beams, herring. These are all carnivorous fish. They are all depending on living. Uh, they are all living on uh, on biomass, like on these animals, so plankton and so on. So there is just simply not enough biomass available. And you can break this down. I mean, we are uh, fishing globally per year about 100 million tons of fish. And this, if you, cal you can calculate this down, how much this is in algal primary production, this is about 8% of the primary production which we harvest when we uh, harvest 
of 100 million tons of fish. And uh, when we would basically uh, not harvest fish, but if we would harvest, for example, mussels, we could harvest with the same amount of algal biomass, we could harvest 4,000 million tons, just simply because we are harvesting lower traffic uh, levels. So this would be a way out instead of fishing, uh, the fish uh, focusing more on lower traffic levels, we could harvest much more uh, from the ocean than we do. Another aspect uh, is what is becoming more and more uh, important is um, deep sea mining. And the deep sea is a really a very sensitive uh, ecosystem. These animals are adapted uh, to live on a low amount of food, grow very slowly. So whenever there is damage, the recovery is uh, rather low. And what currently uh, uh, is planned is with this deep sea mining, because we are running out of uh, rare earth and rare metals on, uh, in the terrestrial environment. And there are these uh, nodules uh, in um, the ocean, uh, quite rich in lithium, for example, and other rare earth uh, elements, which we need, for example, for our cell phones and so on. So there is a major effort now in the deep sea mining to harvest uh, these uh, nodules. And for that, uh, uh, instruments and devices and vehicles are designed and built, which look like that, for example, with this drum at the front, with these um, spikes scratching off the seafloor. And they would uh, crawl over the sea floor and harvest these uh, these nodules. And of course, the sea floor. And here is a close-up on how this looks like: these spikes on the drum to scratch off um, uh, material and uh, harvest these uh, nodules, the nodule collector. And this is a an aspect now where essentially the European Union, the United States, India. Australia, they are all basically working on, uh, on, on that. It's really a rush, sort of a um, deep sea gold rush uh, at the moment to harvest this uh, material. And there are negotiations now where this uh, should be allowed and where it should not be allowed uh, because uh, uh, this causes uh, severe damage to the deep sea uh, marine uh, system. And in contrast to, to what I have uh, shown you, like fisheries, uh, the fishery problem, or the deep sea mining problem and others, uh, there are these short-term disturbances. I mean, uh, like the global warming, this is a long-term disturbance, which goes very slowly, largely unrecognized. And in contrast to that, we have, for example, like uh, these oil spills, uh, one of the most spectacular ones over the last a year or decade was the deep sea horizon drilling platform in the Gulf of uh, Mexico, which essentially exploded um, uh, 20th of April in 2010. Uh, as shown here on this picture, where there was uh, essentially a drilling hole open where oil was released over quite some long period, quite over quite some period of time with a release of about uh, 8 million liters of oil per day. And this went on from April till August. Uh, so this is an enormous amount of oil which uh, have been uh, released there in the Gulf of Mexico. And this shows you where um, the dimension of, um, of this uh, oil spill in the Gulf of uh, Mexico moving towards uh, Mobile in uh, Alabama, in Dauphin Island. Uh, and uh, I mean, they use also some dis dispersants um, to basically disperse um, the oil from uh, coming up to the surface uh, to disperse it right in the, in the water column. And uh, they were, I mean, there was a lot of uh, like all these pictures like of seabirds dying off uh, the oil drenched uh, seabirds. 
um, people tried to curb essentially this oil spill with barriers and cleaning up beaches and so on. Um, and then uh, uh, after 85 days in total, oil was released uh, with 8 million tons per uh, million uh, liters per day. And uh, and then in August, uh, basically pretty much of the oil was uh, not really there anymore. And I was actually in uh, September then at a meeting, uh, Ocean Sciences meeting uh, in September. And there was a big discussion on where did all, the, all this oil go. And uh, I mean, there several aspects played into that, that the oil was pretty much... Uh, remineralized very quickly. I mean, the Gulf of Mexico is relatively warm. And there is also what uh, is important is that about 400,000 liter per day are released naturally and seeping through the sediment into the water column per day naturally. So there is quite some oil resources uh, under the Gulf of Mexico, which is slowly seeping out like 400,000 uh, 400, uh, liters per day. So there are microorganisms adapted to utilize these hydrocarbons as a carbon and energy source. So this has been quite rapidly degraded. And this is quite a contrast, for example, to the Exxon Valdez accident uh, of uh, uh, Alaska. Uh, where the oil spill uh, was still detectable after years. And the same holds true for, for example, uh, for uh, the, in the Gulf War, in the first Gulf War, uh, Saddam Hussein also released oil purposely into the Persian Gulf. And after two years, essentially, there were no remains of uh, oil uh, detected anymore according to the Marine Environmental Lab in uh, Monaco, which did an intensive study on that. So the Persian Gulf recovered very quickly. So there are quite some differences. Um, depends very much where you have an oil spill, whether you have warm waters or whether you have uh, cold waters. This makes a tremendous uh, difference. So the potential impact uh, there were uh, just like in Coastal region mangrove forests, of, co of course, were temporarily affected. The plankton in this oil spill was, of course, defected, uh, affected. And um, uh, there were some uh, residues of the oil uh, detected in, uh, in fish. But um, essentially, these sporadic catastrophes, they generate uh, really dramatic pictures. But uh, the real and more fundamental problem, as far as I would see it, is really these long-term changes, like the ocean warming, which uh, happens slowly, does not generate dramatic pictures, which do does not receive um, the media attention as, uh, for example, this uh, sporadic oil spills. So there are quite some uh, major impacts uh, on the ocean because of our activities. Global warming will uh, le leads to a melting of uh, glaciers, uh, particularly the Greenland uh, ice sheet and the Arctic ice sheet. Um, uh, lead, this leads to sea level rise. Warming uh, also increases the heat waves, uh, which we have the sea ice uh, is lost. And uh, so the ocean heat content, as I showed you, is increasing. The ocean is taking up a lot of heat. With the increasing CO2 concentrations, the pH is decreasing in the ocean, and as well as the oxygen is uh, decreasing. And uh, one important aspect is uh, this oceanic conveyor belt, which I have uh, shown you uh, at the beginning of my talk. Uh, and this uh, connecting all these uh, oceanic basins, Pacific, Atlantic, and Indian Ocean. And this heavily depends essentially on um, this deep water formation here between Greenland, Iceland, and the Norwegian Sea. And uh, this means that this conveyor belt circulation pattern here, it, we have a, a warming of the Arctic 
we have uh, the sea ice is retreating there. And what happens now is, and this has been shown over the last uh, 10, 15 years, that this deep water formation is slowing down. Um, so which means also the Gulf Stream is slowing down because of course this is all a conveyor belt. So if one component is slowing down, the whole uh, conveyor belt is affected. And if this conveyor belt circulation would really come to a, a standstill or a substantial slowing down, then um, this would affect our cli climate dramatically. And there are predictions uh, now by the Potsdam Institute of uh, Climate Research that, uh, that we have about 15 years left before we reach sort, sort of a the tipping point that the conveyor belt circulation might uh, break uh, up. There are clear signs that it slows down. And this uh, is shown here also. I mean, the ice in the Arctic is retreating. And uh, this leads to an increase in the sea level. So, and there are the predictions in the IPCC report, for example, that the sea level rise will be somewhere in the range between 10 and 90 centimeters by the year 2100. And this leads, of course, that some inhabited islands like in the uh, Pacific, uh, they will be flooded uh, and coastal areas, uh, for example, like Bangladesh will uh, have uh, severe problems, uh, will lose uh, quite some uh, land over uh, the years. And the lower panel here shows you the sea ice uh, decreasing over uh, the years in the in the Arctic. And the main aspect of the sea level rise is, of course, the uh, Antarctic and the Greenland ice shield melting. But also, for example, the uh, what is uh, also um, has also to be taken into account is that even the deep ocean thermal expansion, this is only we are talking here about uh, 0.1 degrees centigrade. Because of this huge volume the deep ocean has, this is all the volume below 200 meters. This uh, thermal expansion is also not negligible uh, here. So the main contributors are the Arctic, Antarctic and the Greenland ice shield and the thermal expansion of surface waters, but also land glaciers, uh, retreat and melting uh, also contributes. Okay, so we are faced with a changing ocean and there is like the physics play there a role. Uh, and there is a tight link between the physical boundary conditions like uh, water current, hydrology, for example, like conveyor belt circulation, water masses, how do these water masses flow? Uh, where do we have cold water masses and warm water masses? This affects directly our climate. This has, of course, the temperature and other has have impact and radiative forcing have impact on the biogeochemical cycles. I mean, I don't want to go into detail. And they, of course, impact also the species uh, composition, the composition of the marine uh, life, not only the marine life, but also uh, the ocean uh, life. And there are several, like the so-called tipping points where we have a change in the system which is irreversible. And uh, some of them with a high probability and a high impact, and this is what I mentioned already, like coastal acidification affecting corals, the deoxygenation, the oxygen loss uh, from um, the ocean. So larger areas of the ocean will be uh, free of oxygen or uh, deprived of oxygen. Uh, then we have uh, permafrost thaw bringing in some uh, inorganic nutrients and so on. And the deoxygenation is affecting uh, quite some parts of the ocean, as indicated here. This is from uh, 200, the oxygen content at uh, 200 meter depth in the ocean. So we do have already quite some uh, areas in the ocean where we have low oxygen or no oxygen. Uh, present like here in the Arabian Sea, but also in the in the uh, Pacific uh, at 200 meters. And there are uh, real predictions uh, that um, the uh, ocean will lose about 25 percent 
of its, of its oxygen content till the end of the century. And this is because of the decreased ventilation, I mean, the circulation pattern that I was talking about, uh, and the warming of the ocean. And this is particularly relevant uh, to have an anoxic water body because we have at the moment only about 0.1% uh, of the global ocean volume, which is uh, free of oxygen. So this is only a small fraction. But this 0.1% of the ocean volume where we have, where we don't have really oxygen present is uh, responsible for 30 to 50% of the nitrogen loss as uh, denitrogen oxide. Uh, so there is a nitrogen loss from the ocean into the atmosphere in form of the uh, nitrogen oxide. And this is also a greenhouse gas. Uh, one aspect, and I'm finishing quite soon, is of course the biodiversity trend. You all know that we are living in uh, uh, basically in the midst, midst of the six um, the major diversity loss. Uh, the first one, the first five ones were uh, caused by meteorite impact, volcanism and so on. And this is the first one caused by human activity and in the marine environment, it's not only a biodiversity loss uh, with, we are faced uh, in the terrestrial environment, but also in the marine environment as uh, indicated here. Um, this shows uh, the change in biomass or so the decrease in biomass uh, with uh, depending on the temperature change uh, of the air temperature change. And here the dotted line, this is um, the temperature change of the Paris uh, Treaty. As you remember in 2015, uh, countries have signed uh, an agreement that to curb essentially the temperature increase uh, to 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade. So if we would manage that, which is uh, doubtful that we manage that, uh, we, this would mean a biodiversity loss of around 5%, which is not really so much. But uh, most likely we don't reach that. Uh, we will probably surpass that. And actually, actually in the, actually in the, in the Arctic. And this has an impact on, of course, all the marine communities and uh, in a different way for like the base of the food web is uh, effect, affected to a lower extent, but the higher we are climbing up the food web, the more pronounced this change will be like here for the higher trophic levels, meaning for fish, for example, they are uh, affected uh, more. And here, these are just different scenarios uh, of calculating of how uh, the CO2 uh, will develop uh, in the future based on um, the IPCC uh, report. So these are different model predictions with, uh, with a drastic, more drastic increase and uh, basically business as usual. Okay, so, but the warming will not affect all the oceans equally at low latitudes. So in the tropical, subtropical regions, we will have an increased algal. We have now quite some low algal uh, productivity in the tropics uh, with warmer surface water called the deep waters and with a warming the surface waters will be warming faster than the deep waters and this leads to a more tight separation between the upper layers and the lower level layers therefore there will be a decrease in the algal productivity in contrast to that in the arctic for example with all the input from uh, the terrestrial uh, systems, from the tundra, for example, runoff uh, from um, like the large Siberian rivers, or Pienese, for example, but also from the Canadian tundra, there will be more nutrients brought into the Arctic Ocean, and this will stimulate the algal productivity. So therefore, I mean, there is a good reason that um, the United Nations have formulated this uh, sustainable development goals uh, till 2030. And one aspect is uh, sustainable development goal uh, 40, uh, 14, which is uh, the uh, life below uh, water 
And we are now uh, just in the beginning of the United Nations decade of um, the oceans, which runs till 2030, with the vision essentially to increase the awareness of what the ocean means for us as human beings to foster uh, not only scientific exchange, but also interactions with the stakeholders and so on, and uh, basically arrive at a sustainable use of the ocean, uh, because this is uh, definitely required, as indicated, in, indicated here in the uh, safe operating space of humanity from the Swedish Institute, where like the biosphere integrity, the, the genetic diversity, so biodiversity loss is a major threat, as well as here the nitrogen, the biogeochemical uh, aspects in here particular the nitrogen is of uh, tremendous importance while well, ocean acidification um, is probably becoming a, a threat but it is hard to do to really experimentally uh, show that uh, because these are so small subtle changes over time that they, you cannot mimic this uh, experimentally so it's hard to predict how this really affects and another aspect is, of course, uh, the climate change. And with that, I'm uh, finished.